Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Murkoff. I'm a second year at Arkansas College of Osteopathic Medicine. I'm super excited to be here today to talk about hydrocephalus, specifically about non-invasive treatment strategies informed by the etiology of hydrocephalus. Before I begin, I want to give a big shout out to Lauren Harbaugh. She's a fourth year at Archon. And to my supervisor and mentor, Dr. Nagra. I wouldn't even be on this project without them, so I'm incredibly grateful for their knowledge and support throughout this. So I'm going to start this presentation by giving some background on hydrocephalus. I'm going to then go in and talk about some current treatment options. And then I'm going to examine the relationship between the functional brain tissue, the parenchyme, and the role it plays in the development of hydrocephalus. And then use this background to tie into how this could inform future non-invasive treatment strategies. So what is hydrocephalus? Hydrocephalus is the accumulation of cerebrospinal fluid within the brain that leads to ventricular enlargement. So cerebrospinal fluid, there's continuous turnover of this throughout the day, um, and that allows for you to maintain intracranial pressures. Um, it has a role in central nervous system homeostasis. It also provides a role as like a shock absorber or as a brain cushion, so it has a protective role. There's a role in lymphatics. It helps with nourishment, toxin removal. Um, so the cerebral spinal fluid is produced um, primarily from the parotid plexus, primarily within the lateral ventricles. It will then move throughout the ventricular, um, ventricular system into the brain parenchyme, and then from there will be reabsorbed into venous circulation. So when it runs through the ventricular system, it'll go through the foramen of the monero to the third ventricle. From there, it'll go through the cerebral aqueduct of sylvis into the fourth ventricle. And then it'll go medially to, through the foramen of meningi and laterally through the foramen of lushka to the subarachnoid space. From there, we'll go to the parenchyme and then be reabsorbed through arachnoid granulations into the superior sagittal sinus. And there's around half a liter of CSF produced per day with a turnover of around every eight hours. So it's really important that there is continuous reabsorption and turnover to allow for normal physiologic functioning. So hydrocephalus, this buildup of cerebral spinal fluid within the brain leading to ventricular enlargement can be described as either communicating or non-communicating. So communicating hydrocephalus, there's no defect in flow, but is rather due to compromised absorption. This is typically seen after a hemorrhage, such as a subarachnoid hemorrhage, or from complications due to bacterial meningitis. There can also be non-communicating hydrocephalus where there's actually an obstruction in flow and this is typically within the fourth ventricle, the foramen of Monroe, cerebral aqueduct. Um, and this is seen in cases of aqueductal stenosis um, or with like a tumor, infection, cyst, anything like that. So currently, what can you do for hydrocephalus? Currently, the gold standard treatment is ventricular shunt placement. In this case, the CSF will be redirected towards another part of the body for reabsorption. The most common type of this right now is the ventricular peritoneal shunting, where a catheter is placed within the lateral ventricle and a distal catheter within the peritoneal cavity, and the CSF will be redirected towards the abdomen for reabsorption. There's also the ventricular arterial shunt, where it is reabsorbed within the right atrium, and there's ventricular pleural shunting, but this is not as common and is really only done um, if one of these shunt types are not applicable. So another surgical approach that can be done is the endoscopic third ventriculostomy. In this case, a surgeon will go in and burrow a hole through the third ventricle floor, and that will allow for reabsorption and redistribution of the cerebral spinal fluid. This is most effective in obstructive type etiologies, and if possible, this is a preferable method because you can avoid the permanent shunt placement. So shunt placement is a very invasive procedure, so it can come with a lot of complications and risk of complications. Um, there is high risk of surgical infection, high risk of shunt failure. Each time that there's a shunt failure, that requires at least one additional surgery, which stands to reason that will increase morbidity and mortality rates. There can also be biofilm formation that can obstruct the functioning of the shunt, and that's typically, typically seen with staph epididymis and staph aureus. Clinically, you can also see neurological complications, including, or one example would be migraines. Um, there can also be CSF pseudocyst formation. And in the case of the ventricular peritoneal shunt, there can be abdominal herniation through the incision site. 
So I quickly wanted to mention a couple of um, non-surgical therapeutics that have been studied experimentally, um, but a lot of the results have been kind of negligible and um, have not been proven that effective and surgery is still um, needed. So something that the Shun um, procedure does not consider is the role of the brain parenchyme in the development of hydrocephalus. So that's where this matrix hypothesis comes into play. So the brain tissue has these integrins, these cell adhesion receptors that play a role in mitigating the relationship between cell to cell and cell to extracellular matrix interactions. So studies have shown that if you reduce specifically the beta-1 integrin expression, that can lead to reduced brain size and a more convoluted cortex. Another thing to consider here is the role of the ligand for the beta-1 integrin, which is the laminin. Other studies have shown that if you mutate the laminin alpha-2 chain, that can lead to the development of hydrocephalus seen with ventricular dilation. So if you take these two things together, there shows to be a, a role that these beta-1 integrins and the laminins play in these adhesion processes within the extracellular matrix in regulating interstitial fluid pressures and in the development of hydrocephalus. So in order to study this experimentally, there needs to be a model of the pathogenesis of hydrocephalus. So Nagra et al. back in 2010 used this Kalin rat model. Um, so they injected these rats with this Kalin substance and the rats developed hydrocephalus. So in this uh, Kalin rat model of hydrocephalus, there was increased outflow resistance that indicated that there was an absorption defect. This was then correlated with, had a significant positive correlation to the severity of hydrocephalus that it um, developed. And this was seen with ventricular enlargement. So because this was an absorption defect, this was a model of communicating hydrocephalus. So they were then able to go forward and study the role that if you mess up these adhesion processes in the matrix, how does that result, does that lead to hydrocephalus, what results? So when they, injected antibody against um, beta-1 integrin, they found that there was expansion in the ventricles and the development of hydrocephalus in these rats. Um, this is shown in images C, D, E, and F, and when compared to the controls of A and B. So they were able to show that if you mess with these adhesion processes with, and specifically with the beta-1 integrin, that there is a changes, they play an active role in interstitial fluid pressures and in the development of hydrocephalus. So how does this relate clinically and what can you do moving forward? So studies have used magnetic resonance elastography, MRE, as a way to study local biometrics of tissues. So they have shown that in hydrocephalus patients, specifically in a study done in 2021, that there is decreased tissue stiffness locally. Um, and they hypothesized that that was due to a breakdown in the mechanical integrity of the tissue matrix. There was also a case study done in 2021. This was a really interesting case study. Um, they had this 19-year-old who had has hydrocephalus, um, and they had low brain stiffness. But then two years later, after undergoing ventricular peritoneal shunting, the stiffness was reversed to a near normal value. So MRE scans is a very effective way and really influential imaging modality that can show that the local brain tissue, but it can also show that the hydrocephalus and the with the low brain stiffness can be reversed with therapy. Um, so there's also uh, diffusion tensor imaging, which is another way that it has been studied um, to visualize hydrocephalus, and you can visualize white matter changes. So in the peripheral tissue, other studies have shown that anti-inflammatories such as alpha tricinetol or platelet-derived growth factor isoform BB can reverse reductions in tissue pressure, specifically within the skin. So going forward, it would be interesting to see how these anti-inflammatories could be a non-surgical, non-invasive um, way to help reverse some matrix damage and reduce symptoms of hydrocephalus. And this could be studied using MRE and DTI data. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Um, I can take any questions at this time. Any questions from the audience? Um, so I have a question, uh, just for clarification, what 
was the treatment um, that you guys imposed for the matrix hypothesis? Was it what was medication more effective or was it um, putting in a VP shunt? So in that case, they used the um, they were going they were saying shunt placement. So going forward, it'd be interested to see how anti-inflammatory such, such as alpha tricinitol or the platelet derived growth, uh, growth factor could be used to reverse the matrix damage. But that's something that would have to be studied going forward. Currently, um, other studies have shown that with the shunt, there can be a reversal in the um, uh, low stiffness of the tissue. Um, but there, because of all the complications that can arise with the surgery, it would be interesting to see if there are these anti-inflammatories that could be non-invasive. All right. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you. Yeah.